Um, it's with a very great pleasure this morning that I'm welcoming what seems to be the serried ranks of the classics department um, who are responsible for teaching Latin, Greek and classical civilization in the Stephen Peirce Foundation. So good morning to you ladies. Good morning. Good morning. Um, and I'd like to welcome uh, Miss Catherine Medici, who's the curriculum leader, uh, Dr. Sonia Kirk, who's a member of the department, and Miss Angela Cheatham, another member of the department. What I'd like you each to do is to say something briefly about yourself so we can understand the context of the discussion we're about to have. So, Catherine, over to you. So, I'm Catherine Medici. I currently run the department here at the Stephen Peirce Foundation. I've taught in a range of other schools, and I've been interested in methodology for teaching classics for a very long time. Okay, thank you very much. Sonia Kirk? I'm Sonia Kirk, and I've worked here at the Foundation for, oh gosh, three or four years now. Um, I've worked in the state sector previously, and of course in the states, and um, my research area is the history of textbooks. Very niche. Thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> and Ms. Cheatham. Um, I'm Angela Cheatham, and I've taught Latin and Greek here for four years now. Um, previously taught at um, Bedford Modern School teaching uh, Latin. Okay, thank you. And thank you for those brief little bios. Um, and what we're here to talk about, of course, is with the classics. And I have to ask you uh, the burning question about the Cambridge Latin Project, because the Cambridge Latin Project, we're in Cambridge, it's very much part of the part of this, this, this city trying to ensure that every young person felt excited by Latin. So if I could start with you, Catherine, what, what, what role has the Cambridge Latin Project played? The Cambridge Latin Project and the Cambridge Latin course, its associated textbook, is believed rightly to have saved the subject. Um, back in the 70s, Latin was under threat from all angles. It was no longer compulsory. Universities didn't require it. And the Cambridge Latin course completely revolutionised the teaching of Latin in this country. It brought in principles of modern language teaching. It made it fresh. It taught Latin through a reading method. And rather than dry and dusty tables of endings, it offered access to the subject through the melodrama of a series of stories about a family set in the domestic world of first century I'm, ADP. I'm old yeah. enough to have used Brevitas and oh, Kennedy's gosh, Latin yes, Primer. Totally different. So that I was obviously the dry and dusty period. Yeah. <laughs> but so it, 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 I know that it's a much loved yeah. um, approach to the teaching of Latin. Um, but I, I whisper it not. But <laughs> I understand that our classics department have a slightly different view on it. And I wondered, Sonia, if you would like to perhaps share with me why do we have to look again at how we teach Latin if the Cambridge Latin Project's done such a good job? Well, the Cambridge Latin Project has definitely done a good job, but um, it has been around for, oh gosh, what is it, over 30 years now? It was in the 70s, so very yeah. long time. Um, and we just simply thought perhaps there's, there's scope for a slightly different approach. Um, many of the things that I've noticed from my experience in teaching is that the thing that really gets students excited are the stories about um, the myths and gods and the heroes of Roman history. And that's something that uh, the Cambridge Latin course, uh, for all its good things, doesn't really touch. It's Caecilius, isn't it? It is Caecilius, um, who tragically and dramatically <laughs> dies at the end of the first book. Gosh, that's very the counselling sessions all round. It, it, it's always a bit of a shock. Um, <laughs> Do they not see it coming? No, strangely enough, they don't. And they know that the explosion of Vesuvius is coming. And even so, they hold out hope. Oh, bless them. Uh, but that was one of the things that um, we all agreed very early on was something that was missing. And of course, all teachers who use the Cambridge Latin course supplement with various different things, whether it's... Um, cultural or grammatical or, or whatever it might be. But um, we decided, wouldn't it be interesting if we could make that the basis, the thing that the kids get really excited about, uh, the things that the Romans themselves used to identify who they were as a people. Um, why couldn't we just go from that basis instead? The myths and legends. Indeed. Um, and Angela, the other dimension of this is not just about the great stories, because I think there's nobody in this room who wouldn't accept that some of the best stories come from the ancient world. But one of the reason, reasons I think Latin uh, failed to thrive uh, was because it was perceived to be a very difficult language to learn. And you always get people saying, what's the point of learning Latin? Nobody speaks it, which I know is a trite thing to say. Um, but from your perspective, why is it important that young people understand uh, you know, grammar within a Latin context? What's the point? Um, that is a question that we get asked quite a lot. And I, um, I, I try not to have to justify its existence because... Mm -hmm. um, a lot of students, most students, enjoy learning it just 
for the sake of learning it, just because they find inherent interest mm. in the subject. Um, they find satisfaction from getting things right. Um, and that's something that we really wanted to bring. And what you're talking about here is also intellectual curiosity, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, How do you make it inclusive? Because it is more difficult for some learners than for others, I think. Yeah, so what the Cambridge Latin course tried to do was to um, use a story-based reading technique, um, which, as Catherine said, like modern languages, was based on the understanding that the more that you read, the more that you would just absorb or learn. Um, and it's quite it's, an optimistic approach. Yeah, <laughs> for some students it really works. Yeah. The, the, the brighter they do um, seem to sort of... Those who can absorb it, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Um, people with very good memories yeah. or very good intuition, linguistic intuition, mm. can get further. But the problem there is that the gap widens between the students that find it more difficult um, and the ones that learn intuitively mm. um, and so what we wanted to do was to make sure that the basics were covered properly without patronizing our students without saying that you can't do this um, and even though there's difficulty involved in that we, we kept the difficulty but we but we kept the vocab base small so that you know they weren't having to deal with too many mm. things in their brains at once um, and consolidating vocab as we went through because the big news here, and I don't know if I've made enough, enough of a fuss about it really, <laughs> is that the Classics Department at the Stephen Peirce Foundation is actually responsible for the first next textbook, <laughs> stroke digital resources, stroke all the stuff around it, uh, for about 40 years in Latin. So Catherine, talk, talk me through that, because this is really exciting. Yeah, it's, uh, well, I hope it is. It is a textbook which is really very different from any other textbook on the market. It tries to sit in the middle ground between the uh, reading approach to the Cambridge Latin course and the very traditional approach of Latin pre the Cambridge Latin course. And it sits in the middle ground because it offers a robust approach to grammar, but it recognises that one has to break it down into bite-sized pieces and it also recognises that different students need different things and therefore we've structured the course um, on a basis of very flexible approach to learning. We have lots of different sorts of exercises that teachers can dip in and out of, all of which relate to the core material within a chapter and that should mean it's possible for teachers to use it as a course to stretch the absolute top end. Mm -hmm. But it's also possible for teachers to use it as a course to keep the lower end engaged um, because, as Angela says, the vocab base is very tight and it's very repetitive, so it builds the knowledge as you go. And the stories are great. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the lower end will find that the stories keep them going because the translation of the stories is at the easier end of the spectrum of the material in the course. So we've tried really hard to make it fully inclusive and to offer the flexibility that teachers need now while also harnessing what we all believe to be the real source of interest in the ancient world and to bring that cultural capital to the fore. And that, I think think um, is absolutely critical in this because I accept what you're saying Angela about we shouldn't be questioning Latin in that way and I'm being a bit provocative because I've got a Latin A level so I obviously value <laughs> it as, in a dusty way I've got a Latin A level um, and I learned a lot of grammar through it actually yeah. but if we the whole inclusion thing is not just about that it's about what you were talking about Sonia that um, it's the power of the story the power of the myth the power of the legend so talk to me about some of the myths and legends you chose and why you chose them it was it was not easy to discard <laughs> anything. It's it an were, awful lot of them. <laughs> oh, gosh, yeah. If it were up to me, this would be a, a six-book series and include <laughs> absolutely everything. So we tried to include things that... Um, Oh, that would resonate with students, um, things that they could um, take lessons from and apply to their life today, things that gave them a greater understanding of, of how this great empire rose and fell and um, the stories that they told about themselves. So um, the, the series is divided into two books, and the first one is largely dedicated to the gods, yeah. um, which uh, particularly the younger students get very excited about. They feel they already <laughs> come into this knowing something about it. And so before we've even cracked open the book, they can confidently have a conversation about, oh yes, I know this and that about the gods and I remember this or that story. So before we even get into this very difficult and challenging subject, they think, um, <laughs> they believe that they've already got a good grasp on yeah. what's happening. So yeah. we start out talking about the Olympian gods um, and we tell stories about Jupiter and Juno. We have some fantastic stories about the uh, the racier aspects of Venus and Mars and their oh, relationship. It's steady. <laughs> um, Age so, restriction on this podcast for this house, right? <laughs> and so everything in the first book is sort of based around that. And so we branch out into culture um, based on the relationship with the gods. So things like um, gladiatorial shows and mm. chariot races, which kids get quite excited about going back to, well, these were originally um, religious festivals. 
um, talking about things like, um, you know, cursing and telling the future and sacrifices and all that sort of things, all revolving back to this idea of the relationship with the gods. And then in the second book, we get more into the history. So um, I think we hit all the big names. We talk about um, exactly as you would expect, plenty of Virgil throughout yeah. because uh, we felt that every student should... I sing should... of arms and the man and all yes, that Yes, sort of indeed. Yeah. Even if they don't carry on to GCSE, they will be familiar with Virgil and his Aeneid. And... Um, Oh, it's all in there, isn't it? It sounds uh, fantastic. Julius Caesar all the way right up through Roman Britain. But what you're really talking about as well, this whole cultural capital piece, sort of, sort of be serious about it, is that it's, I think it's one of the reasons why young people today, they find it difficult to access perhaps Shakespeare, you know, or any of that, rena- that the Renaissance literature, because it does draw upon the world of the classics, doesn't it? And unless you have a, an understanding of that, it just makes those subjects, I think, more inaccessible potentially. So what you're really talking about is, is a gateway. It's a gateway to the cultural capital across the ages. It also helps them question the values of today. So one of the great hooks with the Olympian gods is that they're really horrid. You know, they're not kind. They're not some sort of moral template. And They're quite competitive, helps. aren't they? Oh, massively competitive <laughs> and vindictive and petty and People deceitful. haven't changed. People oh, haven't no, changed. Exactly. <laughs> but it's really healthy for students at a young age to yeah. realise that this assumption that divine power should be beneficent yeah. is completely culturally tied up with Christianity. Yeah. And it helps open their eyes to aspects of their own belief system or their own culture, whether they think of themselves as religious or not, but aspects of their own culture which are relatively modern yeah. and therefore aren't absolute. So I think we've all found it very refreshing. So there's a moral purpose there's around all moral purpose that actually you can look at things that are very different in the past yeah. and it encourages you to question um, the status quo as well and we think that's important oh absolutely um, and Anja coming back to uh, the, the language uh, I remember this is many years ago I've studied Latin but I do remember <laughs> learning about the silver period and the gold period you know and I can vaguely remember what that means but from the point of view of this this new book are you being that granular, you know, with learners that there is, you know, you've got this sort of purest, pure sort of Latin and this other sort of Latin? Well, we wanted, um, for example, the vocabulary base to be um, t- to cover the, the sorts of words that students would come across. And this when is up to GCSE, is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it sits <coughs> mega mainstream. I mean, it sits um, in the Latin which they need to read the text of the Golden Age. So what, I, what exactly, I'm talking yeah. about yeah. is probably what you do in the sixth form, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 exactly. And actually, um, you know, this year we started off with um, using the textbook with all of our classes. Oh, yeah, how did you get so Everybody started at Chapter 1, um, and Year 7 obviously went at the speed that we would like to Did they to know that you'd written it? Um, yes, yeah. And they were using them as basically to, as a test yeah, bed to exactly. see how it worked. Yeah, yeah, and what, yeah. what, what, what response did you get, Angela? Um... I mean, they really enjoyed it. Um, so year 10, um, who obviously weren't at the level of chapter one of a textbook, we did one chapter a week for the whole aut- autumn term and we just whizzed through it. Um, and I think they really en- they really enjoyed it. Um, there's some English to Latin sentences that they particularly enjoyed translating mm. just because of the challenging nature of, of, of that kind of activity where you really have to have mastery over the words to put mm. them into Latin yourself. Mm. Um, and even with my sixth formers who are doing Latin prose composition, some of the sentences I gave them were from our textbook, um, probably a bit more simple than, than they're doing at the moment, but they also found it you know, useful. So, um, Sonia, with the feedback you had, mm. um, would you pot- potentially have changed any of the stories, or are you happy that what you've, what you've got there is going to t- do the job you want it to do? Well, at the time we began... Um, trialing this with the students, um, there was still scope for change. And so some changes have been made. But I think the thing for me that's been really delightful working through that process with the students is that they feel that they're engaged in creating this textbook. And some of them... They're collaborating with you. Yeah, some of them are taking it really seriously. And um, there are certain ones who are particularly interested in finding typographic errors. They've got their eagle eye out for <laughs> various different things. And so it's been, it's been good because I genuinely feel like um, we, we've created a partnership with the students. Yeah. They've, um, we've given them different opportunities to evaluate and give feedback. And, you know, would you recommend that we use this resource or oh. would this video be helpful in that yeah, kind of The whole process, process. Was about learning, wasn't it, really? Yeah. yeah. And so it's really made them think about, is this working for me? How do I learn best? Um, and really engaging with the process of, of not just learning Latin, but of, of education in general. And in terms of some of the, the background topics, the, the cultural topics that we've, we've done, um, I have a... A, a lower ability year nine set um, who will not most of whom were not 
con- continuing with Latin next year. But, they, but it was the stories that really hooked them in, particularly stories about women. So the, the Vestal Virgin, Marcia, who was, mm. who was banished to, to death by being locked, at, bound up in a cave, um, <laughs> and, and left with just enough food and water so the gods could decide whether to save her or not. Um, or, um, you know, Spartacus, stories of, of slaves. It, it was those kind of stories so that they really, really... What, what really I'm really hearing from, from you guys uh, regarding this book is that, yes, it's great if somebody is a linguist or somebody can access the language, then that, that's great. You'd want them to do that and you'd want, you'd want that, 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 them to go, go on that journey. But not everybody can for a range of reasons. And what you're really saying, they shouldn't be excluded from the, the pleasure of understanding this amazing classical world. It's billed as a book which will segue either into Latin GCSE or Class Civ or okay. indeed ancient history. Um, and although, as we're saying, for those who are the most ambitious linguists, there is a more robust base than they will find in the Cambridge Latin course. You know, all the grammar comes sooner and I think is probably explained slightly more fulsomely. But for those who are not natural linguists, they will still get the benefit of the cultural capital engagement with the ancient world. There's original sources for analysis. Um, so so there's a whole tried, range of skills in there. Range, exactly. So, so it's, it's cultural capital, it's exactly. skills, it's engagement. It's and literacy as well. It's literacy. Derivation work, which structure is of language. wonderful for, I know that we're going to be working together looking to engage with the community as well on this because this is a world that everybody should have access to, not just our young learners here. Um, and I just have to say to all of you, what an amazing department you are, because you well, are, you. you have, well, you are, apart from the fact Catherine you left your phone on, but we'll forget yeah, about sorry. that. <laughs> <laughs> you very discreetly switched it off. But I think how many schools can boast of a whole department working together, working with the students, and starting from a set of principles as to what they think, what they thought a good approach to Latin look like, if I can put it that way. Yeah. And yes, the Cambridge Latin Project has been brilliant, but it's good to see that we can move things on, move that debate on. And I really look forward to the book coming out. Go, give us a plug. Come on, give us a plug, Catherine. When's it, it coming out? So inspection copies available <laughs> in January. Hard copy, buy it for your bookshelf, April 2020. And there's going to be all sorts of digital resources exactly, around it. Exactly. It's going to be the website's already up and running. You can find it on the Bloomsbury platform. And what's it called again? Day Romani. <laughs> I think that's enough of a plug. So on that note, I'd like to thank Catherine, Sonia and Angela. That was really interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.